Hey everyone, so today I have with me uh, Thomas Stevenson. He goes to Brigham Young University. Um, he's a reporter for the College Fix, and he also runs the CougarChronicle.com, which is a conservative student newspaper um, at Brigham Young University. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your university and, and how you got started with that paper? Yeah, so I go to BYU or Brigham Young University. It's a college that's it's basically run by and owned by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, with the paper, though, how it kind of got started was that we originally had a conservative Instagram page for students on campus, but then extended that over into reporting and kind of blew up with uh, the story that we did with the BYU Duke volleyball game and a couple other instances where a professor there was a professor that came after us for we critiqued an assignment that we had been sent to us from some students. Great. So let's start with that. Um, why I wanted to have you on too is to talk about several recent stories involving the use of uh, Ibram, Ken Ibram Kendi's work um, at BYU, as well as a professor who was ambivalent about abortion, um, despite uh, you know, I mean, your church opposes abortion. Right. Okay. Um, and so, but tell me a little bit about, so for people who don't remember, a few months ago, um, there was a volleyball player at Duke named Rachel Richardson who claimed that uh, someone kept yelling uh, the N-word at her. her. Her godmother made, you know, broader claims about it, uh, how frequent it was. Um, it was kind of amazing because the whole, you know, match was broadcast on video. No video ever came out of it. Um, just... Typically, people in crowds don't shout racial slurs. Um, you know, typically, um, you know, college students aren't that dumb. Um, but do you want to tell us a little bit about how you kind of got to the bottom of that, what is really a hoax at this point, and which has sort of put you on our radar? And as at the college folks, we always try to spot, you know, talented individuals. And, and we we're, you know, grateful we were able to recruit you. And, and you've written some articles for us, and hopefully you'll keep writing for us. Um, tell me a little bit about how that happened at, it, this game was against BYU, which is how, of course, you got involved. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, tell me a little bit about that, and particularly how you got to the bottom of, of that to kind of prove a negative, which is always so tough. Yeah, so what happened originally was we heard about it over the weekend, uh, myself and then Luke Hansen, he's the other guy that was, that's still helping and was helping me to run the page at that point, uh, and the newspaper. Uh, we made a post, actually, because when BYU banned someone, we thought that was a point of credibility that this actually could have happened. And we said, to sum up, don't use this as an excuse to push left-wing anti-racist ideology on campus, uh, that this is an individual instance, and it's good that he got banned, and we hope that we can, like, dig all this up. But what happened is someone from the athletic department, an inside source, uh, who's anonymous in the report, uh, they came to us and said, hey, this isn't actually what happened, and I want to tell you guys about it. So they gave us some of the info on that. We then reached out to many people who were at the game. Hardly anyone wanted to put out their name in the report, saying that they didn't hear anything. We reached out to people who were on the court who were in the stands, who were very close to the court from the stands and got several different witness accounts of people that were in like the first row who were cheerleaders and put that out and said, hey, this story actually isn't what happened because her, her godmother, Lisa Pamplin, had blown it up out of proportion. Like we still hold the possibility that she, maybe she misheard something, but when her godmother put it out. She said that it was repeatedly said to her on every single time she served from a student section. Then she, I think LeBron ended up tweeting about it and that's how it just exploded. But she had a history of, as I recall, like talking about different race hoaxes as well as <coughs> pushing anti-white racism on her own Instagram, on her own Twitter page. And, and she was running for a judgeship position in Texas. And so it was really what we believe. I mean, we don't know for sure if this was her intention, but we think that that was part of her push to try and get that position uh, when she was getting voted in. 
Right, and race uh, hoaxes is one of my uh, particular interests here at the college fix and college fix in general, uh, especially obviously campus race hoaxes. Um, so that kind of gets into the anti-racism thing um, and a story that you have about Ibram Kendi. For people who don't know, Ibram Kendi uh, ostensibly teaches at American University. We've written several articles, as have others, uh, like the Free Beacon, that sort of question what he does all day um, because he's got millions and millions of dollars from Twitter, you know, former Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey, um, the Vertex Foundation, and all these other places. Um, he rarely ever produces any sort of like academic work. He, they they host various events. He he said he was running a COVID tracker, uh, COVID race tracker. I guess how rich minorities were affected by COVID, but it was a bunch of unpaid. It was a bunch of volunteers with the um, the Atlantic magazine, but he still got money for that. Um, so. Ibram Kendi's work is showing up in BYU classes. Um, again, you, you all can read these stories at thecougarchronicle.com. I will post the links to them below on, on Rumble and YouTube. Um, or you can just go to thecougarchronicle.com and just search for Ibram Kendi. But tell me a little bit about what's going on with his uh, works um, at your university and, and why that kind of conflicts with the, the mission and the message of, of BYU. Yeah, so... I would say overall, just because I've, I've read how to be an anti-racist and marked out in detail what parts were just very out there. And it's in the first chapter that he talks about definitions and sets up the entire book. And he basically talks about in order for things to be not racist or to have basically you need to have equal, equal outcomes on different strata, such as like finances, home ownership of every racial group in order for a society to not have racism in it. But in order to get there, he next says on the next page, I think it's like 19 and 18, he says the only way to do that is through discrimination. And so he's fighting for equal outcomes by discrimination or through discrimination in general. And that itself just shouldn't be acceptable anywhere as far as I'm concerned. But what really sticks out to me is that um, BYU is you, it's, it was the book of the semester in the, in the Kennedy Center, I think it was 2020 or 2021, and then multiple professors have praised it openly. But what's worse is that he's talked about liberation versus savior theology, and he defined liberation theology as like saving the oppressed, helping liberate them, and then savior theology as going out to save individuals from sin by bringing them into the church, which is basically religious missionary work. And BYU and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints participates in that heavily, which is why there's like the musical, the Book of Mormon, why you like have people like, you will see people like make fun of more missionaries that are walking on the street. So it's really heavy in the church, but the topic itself is disavowed by Ibram Kendi, yet we still teach his material in classes at BYU as if it's as if it's good material and the truth. So that's why I wrote that article and had such a problem with it, because I've seen that video of him talking about that as well as read the book, and it's still consistently being taught at BYU. Right. So basically, and I didn't, I didn't, I've seen a few clips some time about theology, but basically his point is to summarize all of like liberal uh theological belief is that you don't have to try to bring people to faith in god or christ you should just politically do things that maybe are good in a broad sense like helping the poor um you know all that that's great but it's sort of like that's that's it and we're not I'm Catholic, so we're not going to have like a theological discussion now. But it's a great, yeah. it's a great point just to bring up that it, it, you know, it conflicts with what your what your church believes. Um, it, not just it conflicts; it's like directly opposed. It's basically saying like, don't try to convert people. Yeah. Um, it's opposed to Christian theology as a whole. Exactly. Well, yeah. Exactly. That's my point. I mean, the Catholic Church has condemned liberation theology. It's basically Marxism, and then they like sprinkle theological like words and phrases over it to sort of like make it palatable to Christians and Jews and Muslims and primarily Christians is, is really took hold in um, Latin America where there's a lot of uh, 
there's a lot of Christians. So, um, and so this gets into another issue with um, an, another professor, uh, I'm not sure if you can name this person, I'm not sure if it's named in your report, um, who is sort of ambivalent about the issue of uh, sanctity of human life and abortion. Do you want, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, but Professor Lutz basically said that if you believe that you're pregnant and you haven't taken a pregnancy test yet, if you take a, what's called a Plan C pill, which is basically a chemical abortion pill, she said that she didn't know the morals of the situation by taking that, which is like, it's still abortion. No matter how you spin it, I think in the audio I talked about, uh, talked about there was a quote unquote interspace in a, in a, where you weren't pregnant to where you were, which just doesn't exist because it's like as soon as there's conception, then you're pregnant. Um, like, <clears throat> like we'll get into the technicalities of like touching the wall of the uterine line and stuff, but it's just if you believe that you if you believe that you're pregnant, but haven't taken a pregnancy test yet, does that therefore give you the right to have an abortion? Or, or disavow, or take away your moral obligation to prevent that from happening? Which is basically her point, which was she, quote unquote, didn't know the morals in that situation. <clears throat> which is way out of line with church doctrine, way out of line with just everything that BYU and the church has talked about with regards to abortion. I think the only instances that are exceptions in the church and this is, and it doesn't necessarily dictate that you should have an abortion are rape, incest, and life of the mother, which is, the, I think those are the strictest, strictest exceptions that most pro-life people have. Great, thank you for sharing that. Again, I'll, I'll share a link below. So just the last thing to wrap up, I, I, I'm very interested in how you started um, the Cougar Chronicle, you know, what your team looks like now, and maybe some of those, maybe some goals you have for, for the new year, or just uh, maybe what you would tell other student reporters besides writing for the College Fix, um, maybe how they might go about also doing some reporting on their uh, college campus specifically. Yeah, so how there's a lot of opportunities to get stories, especially on college campuses, if you're conservative. With the Cougar Chronicle, it was just something that I had thought of while we were running the Instagram page for conservative students. I said the official school newspaper, the Daily Universe, has gotten more liberal, and there was already an independent or even further left newspaper that was around Provo. And I said, why don't we? Make paper. So we started it back in February of this year, and I just made a website, and it's gotten better since then. We've gone from different platforms, uh, different website platforms, but essentially, you can do it if you put your mind to it. Because right now, I think we have a staff of about ten. We're expanding the semester, and if you want to make a difference at your school, that's a great way to do so. Uh, whether it's independently at your own school or if it's writing for the college fix or other outlets. Great. Um, well, thank you so much. So just remind, so it is the Cougar Chronicle.com. And then are you, you're on Instagram. What's that handle? Yeah. So the Instagram right now it's conservatives at BYU. That's what it's called. And then on Twitter, it's at the Coug Cron. That's our Twitter account. Great. Well, thank you so much. And obviously people can follow, um, your work um, and other work at thecollegefix.com, same thing, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that. We have all those accounts, MeWe, Truth Social, uh, not Mastodon yet. That's the liberal one. But anyways, well, thanks so much for joining me, and I hope you have a great new year. And, um, you know, we'll keep, we'll keep covering your work at BYU and, you know, your other work for us as well. So thank you so much.